This is the Burris facility where they are manufacturing scopes. It's rare to see what you're about to see, how a scope is made, because not a lot of scopes are made in the USA. And so today you get the all access pass. Let's see just how our scopes are made. All right. This episode of MTV Crib. No, <laughs> MTV Cribs, the Burris edition. Hey, look at that. So we're going to go to the back of our facility. We're going to start with our raw materials and then we'll just kind of work our way to the front and go through the different steps that it takes to make a rifle scope. So in the very back of our shop, we get high grade um, 6061T6 aerospace grade aluminum. We chop it down to size. You'll see it over here. Oh, so we okay, chop, it down, chop it down for our machine so that they can handle it. We look. Why such a, like, what do you do with that? It's so thick. So all of our scopes are gonna be a, milled from a single piece of aluminum. That is awesome. I See, I would have guessed right there. I would have thought that you know, it'd just be a structure with metal wrapped around the tube. No, no. So we, we load that raw material onto this machine. It feeds into our, our first milling process that does, uh, I mean, Lewis is the guy. He can explain it better than I can. So we're getting ready to stock the part out and run the rest of the box. I don't know. I think the cycle time here is only about three or four minutes to go through no and hog off all that material. So when the part comes out of this machine, it will, be, it will have like all of the exterior features and profile finished on the product. That's so cool. I didn't know it looked like that. And then each one of these machines just takes a little bit more off and makes it more refined. And ultimately, you're going to get this. Oh, cool. So this is a whole... Oh, whoa, it's crazy light. Yeah. It does not feel like it should be that light. Right. So, uh, yeah, this is everything except the inner guide tube, the clickers, the elevation turrets. But this is that single that single body tube that we were talking about. Holy cow! That weighs nothing. That's so weird to hold. Is that just me? You guys are used to it. <laughs> a rifle scope like this, which is going to be, you know, comparable to like your XTR Pro, you're going to be over 200 individual components. 200 will be parts? 200 parts. We, it seems like we have 80% of it right here. <laughs> There, there's a lot of a lot a lot of little pieces How many that will pieces go inside. Glass will go in. Oh, no, hey, I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> we built to that. We built to that. Okay. Well, we saw you know making the the tube, but you have tons of other machines. Like, what are all these making? All these other machines. They're making any of the other 200 components that go inside the scope, from the tubes that hold the lenses to the you know the objective mounts that hold lenses to the different components for the windage and elevation adjust assemblies can you show us some random part so some random part oh there's a so case. this is going to be a uh, bottom component for one of our windage and elevation bushings i think these ones here these ones are going to be lens spacers all right here's a diopter lock ring i just got this joke i love the office the parts are going to get machined, and you saw the parts, they're really bright and shiny. And a lot of times also they might have some little sharp points on them. So we'll come back here into our metal finishing area where we go through and we've got a couple of different stages in the back over here. These guys are going to be doing various vibratory deburring, kind of taking all the sharp edges off so that way nobody hurts their, hurts their tender little fingers yeah. or whatever when they're adjusting the scope. And then you know, so that kind of puts this kind of little model type of finish onto the part. Uh-huh. And then we've got to go through and make the finish consistent. And, you know, a nice matte satin black that, we, that you typically see across all the products in, in the rifle scope. So then what we do is we'll take the part and it gets bead blasted. Because, again, aluminum is soft. You can scratch aluminum very easily. Um, so we go through and we do a type 3 anodized to the components. I, I usually like to equate it to an M&M, right? It's the hard candy shell over okay, the, yeah. the soft aluminum material on the inside. Um, and then it also gives you the decorative black finish that we're looking for nice. on the product. <laughs> this is where you keep the velociraptors. I've seen Jurassic Park. All right, so these all these finished parts ready to be assembled, huh? Yes. Yes. That's a lot of parts. You'll we'll cut a job for them and then we'll go through, say, for five. How many lenses so go in a scope? Uh, on average. On, on average, uh, at, with our higher end products, it's 10 to 11. Okay. Um, with some of our entry level products, it might be about five. Hmm. Okay. Yes. That's a lot of parts. <laughs> if I were to just hand you a random part, could you tell me what it is? Like, if we were to go through every box, how many of these boxes could you say, I know what that is? 
So this is a LRS illumination control board <laughs> lock ring. <laughs> That's not bad. He's not going to miss many of them. I, I, I won't miss very many of them. So you guys are always coming out with new products. Let's say you're making a new scope and it's going to be announced tomorrow. How long have you been making it before that? Three months ahead of time before we're going to go through and announce it so we can build up production stock so that when we announce it, we can go through and start filling orders right away. Oh, I'm told so, you get to play with the lasers. So it's going to start off as like a black heart and then the laser machine the high no power way, that's so cool the high power laser basically cuts through the uh black aluminum oxide layer that anodized layer that we talked about and it's going to expose the aluminum substrate underneath and that's what kind of gives you all those white markings so they are permanent really? I, would, I thought part. that was painted nope no paint I could watch this all day. We, we kit them up and we put them into the assembly room. And this is the start of that process where it's gonna go through a wash process. So the parts will go through a multi-stage ultrasonic wash with multi multiple steps right here to make sure that we get as much of the dirt and contamination off of the parts before we put it into our clean room. Then it kind of comes over into our main assembly line over here. So, so she's shaking that's like the erector tube is that what they call that yep and so what's she doing exactly so this one here we've already put a couple of the different lenses in we've put the cam tube in that changes the location of the lenses when you're changing magnification and then we've just got one more lens this is called our collector lens that goes in on the front of it she's making sure it's clean one of the things so we've turned off all of the overhead lights that allows us to really see very clearly any sort of dust, or any speck of debris. Mm. I mean, they're seeing pieces of debris that are five microns in size or whatever. And this is a component here that's gonna go get kind of buried inside the rifle scope. So getting access to it later means- It's too late. Too yeah. late. I mean, yeah. it's almost a full tear down. A lot more work to tear it apart. A yeah. lot more work to tear it apart. So that's when I change the magnification. So it's running along those you tracks. That magnification, see how it's moving. These it's lenses. Whoa, that's cool. These, these little brass carriages hold the lenses. It's going to move those lenses in kind of perfect harmony to the different position to make sure that the the reticle stays in focus, the object that you're looking at stays in focus at no matter what magnification that you're sitting at. So after the parts kind of get get washed and we go through and we do the sub assemblies then we start going through and we feed start feeding the outer portion of the of the of the line and so we just start building the scope so this is you know similar to what we saw out in the machine shop right and we start with side focus so our, our, in, in our assembly we have now installed I don't know if you can kind of see down in there but there's a lens carriage inside here inside the, this, this portion of the tube. Mm -hmm. And as you go through and as you rotate your side PA knob, it's going to change the position of that lens in order to adjust for the focus at the to different distances. So we went through, we built up the, uh, the side focus. Now we're gonna be going through and building up the illumination. What are these? So these are, these ones here are some of the circuit boards for controlling the illumination on our XTR Pro illumination knobs. And that's what we're building up at this operation right here. So she actually goes through and she builds it up and then checks to make sure that it's working at each and every step. You can see that LED kind of changes brightness. And as we get to the brightest setting, then she can go past the brightest setting to switch. She holds it for a couple seconds and then it will switch over to the green LED. And then That's she can check awesome. the brightness setting on the green LED as it kind of goes back down. Now we go through and we're going to be putting on the windage and elevation turrets. So everything that we've been doing prior has all been mechanics. Now we start really getting into the, to the gory optics of the thing. So this is going to be like the objective pack for your uh, XTR Pro. Can I hold that? I'm just curious how heavy that is. Oh, so that front lens is heavy. Yeah. If this feels like just this part feels as heavy as the whole tube was. It is. And that's... You know, it's one of the, 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 the downfalls of using HD glass. You've heard of HD glass. It gives you that ultra low uh, chromatic dispersion, but it's also very dense. You don't get like dense. that pur purple fringing on That's stuff. correct. That's correct. But it's also very dense. It's very heavy. Yeah. And so when you've got a big 56 millimeter objective out, out there, this thing's going to add a You're lot of weight to your scope. And 
you know, it's, it's, it's a drawback. It's, it's always a balancing act of, do we want a scope that's going to be lightweight, but may not perform optically? Or do you want something that's maybe a little bit heavier that's going to have that higher optical performance? It definitely becomes much more of a, of a decision factor when we're getting into some of our hunting scopes is, do we really want to have the improved optical performance to allow the hunter to be able to see that deer or be able to see the antlers really clear? Or do we want to save a little bit on weight? A lot of times for Burris brand, we err on the side of, we want you to have the best looking optic. And if it weighs a couple ounces heavier, so be it. Deal with it. Deal with, <laughs> Deal with it. Yeah. So if we're looking at, thing, at, at this thing from this direction, you've got an eyepiece back here, right? And you go through and you change the magnification. The reticle is on the other side of where we're changing magnification. Mm -hmm. So that's why when you go through and you've got the objective system on this side, the objective system is going to form an image right at that focal plane. And as you zoom in and out of the image, the reticle gets bigger and smaller, but it never changes size relative to the object that you're, that you're looking so at. So that's just if the reticle is here or there. If it's at the rear focal plane, okay, then that's behind all the zoom system. Yep. So when you go through and you change magnification, the image is going to get bigger and smaller, but the reticle is going to always stay the same size. Then we have to go through and we have to do our final focus on the scope, which is what we call collimation. Now you asked about some of these different windows. And that's where we're going to go through and use these different windows right here. In case, oh, targets, yeah. You see out there, you see the target out there. Incoming so enemy, you yeah. kind of open these up and start opening fire. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. <laughs> okay, so he's just looking through here. So this is, this is Ivan, this is one of our collimators. So that's our, that's our target board that we're going to go through and we're going to look at our scopes at to make sure that they're parallax free, that they've got good image. So Such again, violence, Olivia, come yeah. on. Before I get my frustration out. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> Me and Olivia don't get along very well, so whenever I come around, she has to go around a little bit. Go, another scope gets broken. But we're always kind of checking to see for any sort of debris or anything like that that gets generated inside the scope. It would have gone through our collimation process. It has side focus, illumination, it's got our windage and elevation clickers on it, it's got our objective in, and now it's locked in with a lock ring, so that's been collimated and adjusted for. It has the zoom system, we've installed a power ring so you can adjust that zoom system, and the last bit that we're doing is installing on the eyepiece. Then we go through, and now we start getting into our testing of the product. And they're going to put it onto their stand, they're going to look out at the target, and so the first, you know, when we looked at the station before, they're going to be doing more adjustment. Mm -hmm. Now they're going to be doing more evaluation and inspection. They'll also have done a, a mechanical recoil test, which we can go through and show you the mechanical recoil machine that we've got. It's kind of noisy, so we don't do it inside of here. Um, but we do a mechanical recoil to 100% of the scopes that we're making cool. in here. Cool. What kind of recoil would that simulate? Is that, you know, to a... So it's, this is going to be similar to like an AR-15. And what we found is, well, an AR-15, really, you know, it's a small caliber bullet, right? But you've got all those other mechanisms inside there creating all kinds of crazy vibrations and whatnot. Even though this isn't necessarily recoiling to like a 375 H&H or something like that, a 375 H&H, what we've found through our testing doesn't damage a scope nearly as much as like an AR-15 would. Huh, interesting. So, I mean, it's, it's heavy recoil, you feel it a lot, but it's like a single impulse. It's not like a single impulse with a lot of vibrations and crap going on. This looks like one of those computers from the 1950s, you know, with all the knobs and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a pretty new machine. Really? That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> but this is actually our purge machine. So, in order to make sure that your scopes don't fog in the field, you need to make sure that you get all of the moisture outside of the out of the inside of the scope. How does it get in? Because I thought everything was you know tight once they install it already. So we do have uh, on all of our scopes we have usually one removable screw or one removable component that we can still go through and have access to be able to exchange air or in this case nitrogen and vacuum into the scope in order to uh, be able to remove as much of the moisture out of it as we possibly can. That's awesome. But we have this thing go through and cycle numerous times and we figured out we can get at, we can exchange about 99%
of whatever atmospheric air was in there and replace it with good, clean, dry nitrogen. Cool. So we actually don't have, you know, a big column of water. We actually have a pressure tank. So we'll go through, we drop it into our little pressure vessel that we've got right here, lock it in, and we've got everything already pre-set up. So it's going to go through, pressurizes it to about 15 PSI, 14.2 is, is what it should be calibrated to, which is equivalent to 10 meters of water. Oh, wow. Making sure that hopefully when you throw it to the bottom of your pool, which isn't 10 meters deep, it won't take on any water. So when I do throw scopes into my pool, <laughs> which I try not to do regularly, um, sometimes I'll, I won't see any of the humidity or anything until like an hour after. So like, how do you know now that it worked or not? So one of the things that we'll do, this, this water tank, this is actually heated water. So it's heated up to 130 degrees, 131 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that does, but what we would do is we would go through and we would take the scope after it comes out of the pressure tank and we'd put it in hot water for 60 seconds. Uh -huh. And that goes through and that takes, if you had any water inside of there and it basically kind of kind of almost turns it into steam, yeah. if you will. It's obviously not hot enough to, to fully turn it into steam, but then you're gonna go through and you, potentially, you could go through and you could look at the scopes And you could look on the lens surface and you can see, you know, do I have any fog or anything like that inside those lenses? Oh, that's cool. And we have, oh, I need one of these signs in my life. Just need recoil in general. I like that. <laughs> this is awesome. This Seeing is so everything you guys make. Right. So it, it's rare to see scopes made in the USA. Right. So I, I love that you guys are manufacturing right. stuff here. So, so we got not both. all your scopes are made not in the all USA. So obviously, obviously uh, we, we have both. Okay, mm -hmm. so, 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 so you just saw all the investment and, and activities we do to make scopes. One thing I'll say, when you make them, it makes you a much better sourcer of scopes because you know what you're looking at. I bet. You're sourcing them, okay? You know what to look for and what to, what to pay attention to. <laughs> so this is for scopes that are made elsewhere. This is what you guys are doing to make sure it's what you want it to be. That's correct. So similar inspections that we did over in the, uh, in the assembly room that we have here, we'll be going through and doing similar inspections to the product here. All right, so we showed the whole process, everything from raw materials out to finished, but after the sale, there's still customer service. Yes, sir. And that's where you get to hang out with Josh. Hi, guys. So today we're gonna to talk about our custom knob process. Uh, we offer it for a number of our scopes. So come on in. I'll I did not know that. Yeah. So this is if you, you know, want to have a, a turret that's, you know, custom to your ballistics and stuff. Yes, sir. And the end output kind of looks like something like this. So they'll get their yardage increments. So instead of seeing one MOA, two MOA, three MOA, they'll just know yardage. they got a dial to four, yep. 400 yards right there. Yep. You know, we do have a no questions asked forever warrant. Uh -huh. And that means no questions asked. Like we get- Holy crap, all the time. what happened? That, that took a ricochet during a, a three gun competition. No way. Yep. So the that was in a barrel and the guy was running the course. He actually picked it up, shot the course with it. He actually won the match with that scope still. And uh, if, if you look through it, there, there's definitely some damage inside of it, but it still functioned for the match. Okay, that is funny. I think we've even got a scope that some disgruntled family member beat up with a Chainsaw, Chainsaw, hacksaw, <laughs> miter saw. She took it, about everything she wanted to, that guy's poor scope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that that was a muzzle loader explosion, double charge. No way. Yeah. How is he or her? He was oh in the wow. hospital. Yeah. Wow. So probably just the barrel just blew up right there, huh? Yeah, but oh, oh, all these folks got new scopes. And, I mean, we take care of them. New scopes and new body parts. Yeah, every, new body parts. Yeah. What's this guy? Th this is the one we were just talking about. the The gentleman's wife was upset with him and took a few variety of saws to his scope. Hey, cautionary tale, folks. Bring flowers to your wife or <laughs> that kind of thing. It can happen to anybody. Right. It can happen to anybody. And Emily, don't get any ideas. No. <laughs> Th this uh, this one here, the guy's uh, revolver fell out of his holster. Hmm. and he had a strap on on it and 
he drug it behind his truck for like 30 miles back to his house so wow that's paved that looks like an old scope too like this has been around it's one of our our uh two to seven handgun scopes uh th these two came in from california Ooh. wildfires so. some of the custom leather jobs yeah that came back to us from saudi arabia yeah really yeah wow. very yeah. cool we've, we've seen a lot of crazy stuff i had a, a guy one year uh his truck went through the ice with some of our steiner binoculars he went there about eight months later after the lake on frozen alaska retrieved them we swapped those out for him and so so is does every product have the same warranty or there are some that every product but less? our thermal families our, our thermal families carry a three-year warranty everything else is our forever warranty awesome okay then this is where everything is stored and shipped jordan's filling in on shipping today yeah definitely we're uh, getting you set up with uh, some more veracities to check out awesome uh, oracle 2 you wanted to try so very cool gonna ship a label on this get it sent to your house and you can uh, put them through their paces cool and you guys have some really exciting products coming up and so i'm excited to show those off on the channel but uh hey we're not too long appreciate your time thank you